Mike, you're talking about the conflicts within an individual. It strikes me that there's a whole new, gives a whole new meaning to your internal mechanisms when we talk about internal and external mechanisms of the organization. Now we're within a, in a, a person. My knee-jerk reaction uh, is to say, these strike me as very important theories. As a finance guy, I want to test it. How do we test these things? I don't know yet. Um, I guarantee you they will be testable. We've begun to measure the impact that the course has on the students, the participants, um, both from the beginning to the end of the, of the um, course and then at a later period in their life. From the feedback we get from the students, both um, the participants, both the students that are there and the professionals, um, both managers and consultants, uh, there's no doubt that it has uh, a substantial impact on their life and, uh, and their success. But all, that all needs to be quantified. Um, it's a little bit like the agency paper when we wrote it. Um, you know, it wasn't obvious how to test it because you can't measure agency costs directly. So you have to get uh, indirect tests. Uh, that's not unusual in economics. There's a whole bunch of stuff we have to do. So this is, um, the proof is yet to, to come in from our experience over the last six years of developing this course, and I think we've got uh, at least two or three more years before it's complete. Um, I don't have any doubt that it has a substantial impact, and I don't have any doubt that we're getting a lot better at both figuring out what the theory is and delivering it. And um, we're just, um, we make it all available on SSRN, all of the course materials, and anybody's free to use it uh, for whatever they want. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about governance issues as yet. Um, we're being focused on how to remove these constraints that limit people from being effective uh, leaders. And we do a little bit more than that in the, in the course we create and distinguish, I think, for the first time, leader and leadership um, in a way that, uh, that nails that uh, problem to the wall. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it and having a great deal of fun, and it's nice to see that it actually does have some relationship to uh, the work that I've done in finance and organizations in the past. And I do want to thank uh, my co-instructors and co-authors, uh, Werner Erhard and Steve Zafron and, and Carrie Granger, who's at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Excellent, excellent. Mike, I, I'd like to turn to your entrepreneurial side and how technology is changing the profession. Your work in co-founding the JFE um, has dramatically changed the field. I mean, I. I think the emphasis on fast turnarounds and clear, concise writings have been very instrumental. SSRN has also dramatically changed the field. The last time I checked, SSRN had over a quarter of a million abstracts and about 32 million downloads. Could you comment a little bit on those contributions? What led to those and where do you see the, the field going? Well, the. Um the Journal of Financial Economics arose out of the um, fact that the profession, uh, as in those days we called them the old guys, uh, had very little interest in publishing the stuff that was being produced by these young new guys. And um, so we decided to resolve that problem by um, founding the Journal of Financial Economics, uh, myself and Gene Fama and Bob Merton. Um, and in a very short period of time, we did succeed in providing an outlet. Uh, eventually, Renee Stoltz, who had uh, been working with me, came on board and working with me as an associate editor, uh, went off to run the Journal of Finance, and that closed the deal. Um, it then, that part of it shifted, and meanwhile, another group of people started the review of financial studies, which also had a big impact, and suddenly all of this stuff could get published in legitimate places. 
Um, and that made a difference in the development of the field. Uh, it was in 1994, I think, that I became an accidental entre entrepreneur with uh, Wayne Marr, who invited me to join him in creating something that it was at that time called uh, FEN, the Financial Economics Network. And that was in the very early days of the internet. And, um, and uh, then at some point, um, and I was there in name only, and at some point I got more involved with it, and eventually Wayne went off to do something else. He's now dean at the business school at, at the University of Alaska. And um, I, we had this vision that there was, ought to be a way to increase uh, the communication among scholars worldwide so as to reduce the lag time between when working papers got produced and when they finally got um, refereed and published years later in, uh, in the journals of the day. And um, even in the, J in the JFE where we specialized in providing rapid turnaround time, it was easily a year to two years and sometimes even more before work got published. So. That's all come to fruition, and uh, it's, it, yeah, I believe it's having an impact in getting work done faster. Uh, it's made, it's democratized the, uh, the research process in a way that people, no matter where you are in the world, can get access to the latest working papers. Uh, so I think it's having a favorable um, reaction in a number of ways. And, the theory was that we would somehow figure out how to give it all away and make it up on volume. And after spending a bloody fortune getting it up and running, we finally figured out how to do that. And I want to take this opportunity to thank those institutions who um, have research paper series with, the, uh, with SSRN for helping to fund it, and those universities who uh, buy subscriptions for their faculty to the e-journals. And we are continuing to develop it, uh, and its position is, is uh, becoming more widely known. Recently, we were ranked as the number one open source repository in the world by a Spanish organization who ranks uh, 400 such repositories, and we were very pleased to see that happen. So what changes do, do you envision over the next 10 or 20 years? Uh, will we still have journals? Will they, how will we perform the certification role? I think we will still have journals. Um, uh, I think their role will change. Um, my own dream is that we'll figure out a way to uh, provide a, um, the peer review, the equivalent of peer review in the certification process uh, as through the commons rather than through the uh, refereeing process and journal editors. After having run the JFE for, I don't know, close on to 15 years, and looking back, I see the mistakes I made and the damage I caused to the profession by turning down papers that should have been published. And, um, and I watched referees do the same thing. So it's not clear to me that the system that we've currently got is the best one. I don't mean we at CERN, but the journal system that we've got is actually the best one we can have. Um, you know, Thomas Kuhn wrote an entire book uh, entitled The Structure of Scientific Revolutions when he talked about, in which he talks about the fact that scholars and scientists, and now I'm going to be thinking about editors and referees, aren't really interested in finding out something new. Um, and what they're interested in is running experiments that show that the currently accepted theories work. And I've seen that in uh, practice. For young people, I'll guarantee you that if you ever do anything that's really important and new, it will be rejected. We talked about that earlier this morning. So my dream is that we can figure out a way to complement the journal systems by uh, having papers gain reputations or lose reputations rather than simply be graded once when they're accepted for publication and appear in an A journal or a B journal or a C journal. That's my dream. 
Uh, well, Mike, in, in response to the disclosure of some of the emails relating to publishing papers related to global warming and some of the scandals uh, with those emails, some people have even called for doing away with uh, referees and peer reviewers for publications. Any thoughts on that? Well, that's consistent with the um, with what I said about the limitations and what I saw in my own behavior as editor. I remember at one point, uh, for some reason I had to go back. Probably it had to do with that special issue on anomalous evidence regarding the efficient market hypothesis, which I went back and reread maybe a dozen or more papers that I and the referees had turned down, uh, all of them creating some uh, question about the validity of the efficient market hypothesis. And as I said, the referees and I turned them all down. And eventually it dawned on me that uh, you know any individual paper could be questioned. And maybe, I, but if you look at the whole package, there was probably something there that we ought to be paying attention to. And I believe it was then that I went back and reread them. I, I did that. And I believe it was then that I saw that I had very often missed the most important parts of those paper, papers. And why did I miss them? It was because of this power of context, because I had no, the really new stuff I couldn't see. What I, was, what I had underlined and marked and made comments about was the old stuff. And after some time had gone by, I found myself saying, how in the world did I miss X, Y, and Z in here? That's really good. Now, we've all had that experience with referees and editors. I'm just telling you, I saw it in myself as an editor. And as a result, what I did was overrule the referees, uh, re-invited those papers, and uh, uh, put them in a special issue entitled Some Anomalous Evidence Regarding Market Efficiency and wrote an introduction to it, which I wish I'd never done. Uh, in the introduction, and maybe some of you have seen it, the first paragraph starts out saying roughly, there's no better documented proposition in uh, social sciences than the efficient market hypothesis. And it then went on to say, but uh, the papers, <clears throat> a dozen or so papers in this issue, all call some parts of it into question. <clears throat> I am quoted all over the place, sometimes by my fellow colleagues and scholars, as being blindly uh, uh, loyal to the efficient market hypothesis when the whole purpose of that volume, and the volume was entitled a special issue uh, and uh, some anomalous evidence regarding market efficiency. So that whole story is interesting to me and very, uh, but I think it, it evidences the, the limitations of the current system that we have, and I do think we can do better. It's not going to be easy, and it won't happen quickly. But um, science is going to progress at a much more rapid rate um, than, um, than it has in the past. And we've been doing a pretty good job, even with all these handicaps. But I think we can do better. I'd like to turn to colleagues and advice. Uh, Mike, I introduced you one time by noting that while I wasn't a student of Mike Jensen, anyone that had ever run the market model or uh, used Jensen's alpha, studied corporate governance or compensation or accessed SSRN, was in a very real sense your student. I wonder if you could comment on some of the contemporaries, some of the mentors, some of the uh, people who have greatly influenced your thinking in your career. Well, that's not hard. Uh, my teachers at Chicago, Merton Miller, Gene Fama, George Stigler, um, Larry Fisher, and, uh, and at, when I went, I was fortunate enough that I ended up at the University of Rochester shortly after Bill Meckling had taken over as dean. And Bill Meckling was one of the wisest, smartest guys I've ever met. And, um, we became friends and uh, also colleagues. And uh, he was a man of great judgment and courage and willingness to uh, move against the, the stream. 
and I was very fortunate to be influenced by him. And some others, uh, the faculty member Walter Roy, Donald Gordon, uh, Harry Gilman, people that were there at Rochester, which was not a very high rated institution, but these were very good economists uh, who played a very important role in my early development and, uh, and allowed me and some other young guys there to take risks and, and uh, without worrying about what was going to get published in the next two months, so to speak. The other thing that happened there that looking back on it I see was important is that um, in that organization and later at, at Harvard, I had the privilege of being able to teach the courses that, that I was interested in doing research in. And that's um, incredibly important in the development of young people in organizations is that they be able to teach what they're interested in doing research in. And um, it was interesting in, uh, I woke up this morning thinking about this, <clears throat> thinking about the conversation we were going to have and realized the important role that teaching has played in my life. Um, um, you know, Bill Meckling and I started to teach this course as I, as I discussed earlier on on the organizational problems of large, large multi-divisional firms and doing it through the lens of economics. Um, that became an incredibly popular and powerful course. And then, and then I took it and did something like that in forming a new group when I went to Harvard Business School in 1984. And I had a similar experience now in a different institution with different challenges that enabled me to take that material and the young people I was working with and some senior ones as well, and uh, that further stimulated um, the work I did, uh, the free cash flow stuff and uh, modern industrial revolution and <clears throat> private equity. And there I had the ability to get involved with actual organizations through the case writing activities and. It was, it was very, very stimulating. Um, the, um, yeah, it was interesting, what I realized this morning was that I've recreated that. I became emeritus in the year 2000 at Harvard and, and um, didn't, hadn't taught uh, very much. And it wasn't but a few years, I think it was 2004, and I'd created a new teaching opportunity with Mark Zupan and Werner Earhart and Steve Zaffron and Carrie uh, Granger to uh, suddenly I'm involved in teaching leadership and creating a leadership course that uh, my intention is should change the world and change the way leadership gets taught in business school curriculums. And at the same time, I can say that it's, it's been, um, it is, I said earlier, it's just my way of getting into this ontological material and uh, beginning to collect and lay bare what I've come to call the ontological laws of human nature. And um, I am absolutely convinced that it's going to have a huge impact on, on the world and business firms and will result in the next 20 years in us doing things in a different way. It's very exciting. Well, Mike, I'd like to conclude with two questions. And the first is, advice. What advice would you give to newly minted assistant professors today coming out facing the challenges of, of today? Oh boy. Um, they really come out at, at a time with university budget constraints and pressures both on their personal lives and their personal finances and the organizational lives that is very different than the growing world that I was privileged to come out in. But uh, what I'm going to say is not going to provide access, I think, to anybody because I don't know how at the moment. But I think it's very important no, I'm going I'm to put it in a different way.
what will make a difference in your life is a couple of things. These happen to be the foundations for great leadership. They're also the foundations for a great life. And they're also the foundations for a great company. And what are those things? There are three things, and I'm not going to talk in detail about them, but you can read about them elsewhere. Not in any particular order, is to come to understand the power of integrity, living a life in which you honor your word. What do I mean by honoring your word? That you, when you give your word and it comes time to keep your word, you either keep it or if you're not going to keep it, you announce to those who are depending on you to keep your word that you're not going to keep it or you're not or you're not going to keep it on time, and you clean up the mess in their lives that you caused by not keeping your word or not keeping it on time. That's integrity. The second thing is authenticity. As an individual, being true to who you are, not presenting one face to the world while there's actually something else going on, and that is as important and powerful as integrity in getting along in the world. Now, people will pledge allegiance to authenticity, and very often what they do in trying to become authentic is to go out and act like an authentic person. Now, if you're acting like an authentic person, you're not being authentic. So this one I can give you an actionable pathway, pathway to authenticity. It is, it starts with being authentic about your own inauthenticities. That's the path to authenticity. And it will have a huge impact on your life and your productivity. Lastly, and this is, uh, all of these come straight out of this work on leadership. And I owe a great deal of thanks to my co-authors for helping me to understand them. The last thing is, and I don't have a short word for it, uh, we call it being committed to something bigger than oneself. What do I mean by that? I mean being committed to something bigger than you and your personal concerns. What do I mean by that? If you're committed solely to your wealth or solely to your fame or solely to how, or to how good looking you are, how admirable you are, that none of those are bigger than oneself. That is not a recipe for a great life, or great leadership, or a great company. Um, it solves a problem in my intellectual life between value maximization and what I used to call vision. I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to, I'll expand on this in this bigger than oneself uh, to give you a a hint as to why you want to pay attention to having some access to it. Every single one of us uh, is going to go through a period in our lives that we've colloquially labeled the midlife crisis. What is that all about? <clears throat> For me, I believe what it is, is a situation in which we as individuals, we start out young, we have an entire lifetime ahead of us, unlimited opportunity set, and uh, anything and everything is possible. And we go along and we make choices and we become PhDs, and we researchers, faculty, whatever 
we choose, race car drivers, movie actresses and actors. At some point in life, it's inevitable that we shift from measuring time from the beginning to measuring time to the end. And what happens as we go through that shift, we are confronted with the realization that we no longer have an infinite set of possibilities in front of ourselves. And this is where men often buy red convertibles and get new girlfriends and women do the equivalent. And associated with it is the following kind of realization in the question, is this all there is? And, uh, and that reflects the realization that our opportunity set is now much more constrained than we were used to thinking about it. And that's where the, is this all it is? Now, if you've figured out what it is that you're really committed to that's bigger than yourself, um, you'll get through that period of time in your life very well. Because you've got something out there that turns you on. For me, I eventually figured out what mattered to me. And there are four things. Individual freedom. Don't ask me where these come from. They just matter to me. And you'll figure out what matters to you. honesty and integrity, and I said that long before I really understood what those meant. And the third one was efficiency, no waste. For reasons I don't know, I just can't stand waste. Maybe that's one of the reasons I study organizations and organizing. And the last one that I finally figured out after two broken marriages was joy. There ought to be joy in the process. Now, I'm not saying that's anything that anybody else should be devoted to, but what I realized is that for many, many years, even before I fully understood it, um, those are the things that matter to me. And if it, whatever I'm doing, let me put it another way, if what I'm doing or is available for me to do doesn't satisfy one or more of those four dimensions, I'm not doing it. And it's not like I go through life asking myself, does it do this one? Does it satisfy that one? It just is what drives me. If, as happens with many of our students, we come out and what's driving us is our own personal wealth or our own personal fame, I guarantee you that will not get you no matter how much money you have. And no matter how famous you are, look at movie stars or famous entertainers, it won't get you through this midlife crisis, the crucible that we're all going to have to go through. And the secret to getting through that and living a great life, as well as the foundations of great leadership and a great company, is to be committed to whatever turns you on that's bigger than yourself. And I want to be careful because I'm not saying that wealth is bad and I'm not saying that fame is bad. But if that's all you're committed to and there's not something bigger that involves something other than yourself, there's going to, you're going to find a hollowness in your life. Now let, me say, let me say a few words about how that applies to companies. And, you know, I've been a loud advocate of value maximization as the objective function I later in the paper on, uh, on uh, stakeholder theory and value maximization argued that value maximization is not a vision. It's not a strategy. It's simply the scorecard that tells you how well you're doing in that strategy. And I never could complete that argument um, in a way that was satisfactory to me. But I now think, and I will write something up to complete it, I now think the answer to that question for a business enterprise is that it, can't, it must be 
it's going to be really great, it must be committed to something bigger than itself. That means it has to be committed to something bigger than value maximization. Value maximization or value creation or value destruction is the scorecard that you use to decide how you're doing. But if you're going to have an amazingly successful business, it's going to have to be committed to something out there, bigger than itself, like ending cancer, Genentech, something like, something like that was at the source of that company. Uh, SSRN, revolutionizing the way research gets distributed and therefore the way it gets done. Um, every great company, people aren't going to wake up in the morning and come to work with passion to maximize the value of the stock. It has to involve something that's bigger than the company, service to its concern, consumers. And that's a very important part of every successful company. The auto, American automobile industry didn't have that for a long time. Porsche has it. They are absolutely committed to building the best automobile and the fastest automobile in the world. And they've done a remarkable job in a small niche. So there's, that's what I have to say in terms of advice. Uh, it also has some intellectual content that help us, I think, as we get it sorted out, resolve a whole lot of problems and debate and discussion about the role of private enterprise and corporations and CEOs and chairman and governance systems. And the thing that's been missing, um, we've all kind of understood and maybe certainly I didn't have it as well formulated now as I do in terms of in integrity and authenticity thanks to my co-authors. But I think the thing we really have missed is this bigger than oneself or bigger than the company. If that's missing, there's something hollow you won't get through those crucibles. You won't. And in their personal lives, if you've got that, you figured out what that is, uh, you aren't going to have a great deal of trouble with the midlife crisis when you start measuring time from the end. Very important about this commitment to something bigger than oneself is that that is the source, the reservoir, from which passion results. Passion about life, it comes from what you stand for and what you're committed to, and it isn't the same if you're only committed to yourself. As we said, people don't wake up in the morning passionate about coming to work if it's just about dollars. But that's true of people's personal lives. And if you're a great leader, or as an individual, you're going to go through very difficult periods in your life in which challenges occur. And it appears like there's no way to win. There's no way to survive. And the strength and the passion that it takes to get through that comes from this commitment to bigger than oneself, something that's bigger than oneself. With that, I want to thank you for all of your time today and your extraordinary uh, thoughts on these very pressing issues, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, Ralph.